Good afternoon, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to today's um, Thursday lunchtime lecture. It really is wonderful to be welcoming you all here today um, for um, today's lecture, where we'll be looking at English royal tombs um, with Professor Aidan Dodson. Now, um, apologies um, if there are any issues um, with connections. Hopefully, everything should be um, going well with everyone. Um, but if you've got any questions or any problems, please do use the comment feature below. Um, we are making a recording of this, so um, if there are any problems technically, um, we will be able to post it on after we've finished. So if you see any links posted throughout this um, lecture telling you you can watch it elsewhere, please don't click any of those links. You can only watch them live on our lecture, on our Facebook page. So I'm going to pass you on to our Chief Executive, Peter Reyes now, who's going to tell you a bit more about Church of the Week. But we've got a little surprise for everyone today. Um, but as I said, um, enjoy the little surprise and then we'll go into Church of the Week with Peter. Oh, hello. I think... Uh... The Church's Conservation Trust brings you Church of the Week. Well, hello everybody. I hope that you all enjoyed uh, our little jingle. We're really pleased that the little jingle was put together by the Royal School of Church Music, who are great friends of ours. And that was a romp through uh, church music from the ages, uh, which we thought was an appropriate thing to launch uh, Church of the Week with. Um, so this week, I'm very pleased to say uh, thank you to Ecclesiastical Insurance for sponsoring this slot on our lecture series. Uh, we're very grateful for their support of our lunchtime lectures. And so today's Church of the Week is St Mary's Tarrant Crawford in Devon. So this is a church with royal connections, but more on that later. Tarrant Crawford is the lowest of eight villages or hamlets, seven of them still with churches on the Little River Tarrant. It lies in a gentle valley close to the confluence of the Tarrant and the much larger River Stour. With only an old farmhouse and its building standing anywhere near the church, Crawford is now a tiny little place. But, by, but the name of the house, Tarrant Abbey, and a barn and another farm building nearby, which are clearly of medieval origin, are clues to its former greatness. A small monastery is believed to have been founded here in the 12th century by Ralph de Cahames, I hope I pronounced that right, who was lord of the manor of the neighbouring parish of Ta Tarrant Keniston and gave it its name. The present church is quite separate from the abbey and is evidently served, uh, served the village and parish, serves the village of parish and parish of Tarrant Crawford, consisting only of a nave, chancel, slim west tower and north porch. It is relatively small and gives no hint that there was once an important monastery close by. However, the fact that the main entrance is on the north side with only a small block doorway opposite, an almost windowless south wall of the nave, suggests that there were once other buildings immediately south of the church, and it certainly seems like these would have been associated with the abbey. Here you can see some of the detailed shots of the 16th century tower and the 15th century porch. Interestingly, when the tower was built, a two-light window of the late 13th century, evidently displaced from the nave or possibly from an earlier tower, was reset in the west wall. The series of wall paintings, dating mostly from the 14th century, which are the outstanding feature of this church, take full advantage of the large, unbroken expanse of wall. They were rediscovered in about 1910 to 1911, but not fully revealed until 1948 to 1949. Although sadly, now somewhat faded, the wall paintings at Tarrant Crawford are still very impressive. Unusually, many, many have survived and cover most of the wall surfaces of the nave. The earliest scheme of painting dates from the 13th century. On the south wall of the nave is an extensive wall painting interrupted only by the doorway that's now blocked and is divided into two tiers. 
On the upper tier is the life of St. Margaret of Antioch. She was one of the most popular saints of the late Middle Ages, and here her life was portrayed in no less than 14 scenes and was considered by Cl Clive Rouse to be the most extensive and complete portrayal in England. On the lower tier are paintings also from the first half of the 14th century and can be seen depictions illustrating the mortality of the three living and the three dead, three kings or princes out hawking come across three skeletons who warn them of the em emptiness of earthly rank and riches. There's a lesson for us all in these guys. This unfortunately isn't owned by the Church's Conservation Trust, but is in fact Salisbury Cathedral, uh, one of the finest cathedrals in this country. But we have a very important link with the cathedral that you can see here. In about 1228, the monastery was re-endowed as a Cistercian nunnery by Bishop Richard Poor, Tarrant Crawford's most famous son. He was even baptised here. He was successively Bishop of Chichester in 1215, then Salisbury in 1217, and finally Durham in 1228. During his time at Salisbury, the building of the present cathedral on its new site was begun in 1220. Poor returned to his native parish to die and was buried in the abbey here in 1237. It's reputed and local legend says that the coffin slab on the left is that of Richard Moore. The coffin on, lid on the left, also local legend said, is purportedly that of Queen Joan of Scotland, who died at Tarrant Crawford just one year after Richard Poor in 1238. Joan was born in 1210 and died in 1238 at the age of 27. She was the third child of King John and Isabella, and she was the niece of John's brother, Richard I, as I am also known as Richard the Lionheart. She married Alexander II on the 21st of June, 1221, at York Minster. Alexander was 23. Joan was almost 11. They had no children and they would become estranged and Joan allegedly died in the arms of her brothers, King Henry II and Richard of Cornwall. In accordance with her, rich, her wishes, she was buried at Tarrant Crawford. Joan and her brother Henley, Henry were close to it, close it would seem. Almost 14 years after her death, Henry decides to honour his sister by creating an effigy of a queen in marble for John, Joan's tomb at Tarrant Crawford. This makes it one of the first funerary effigies of a queen of England. And again, uh, a queen in England, sorry, because sorry about that. Again, legend has it that Joan is now, is now buried in a golden coffin in the graveyard. Thank you very much. That was Church of the Week, a fantastic Tarrant Crawford. Over to you, George. Thanks, Peter. So I'll just wait for Peter to stop his screen share there. But everyone, um, that was Church of Week. So that was Tarrant Crawford um, down in Devon. And we hope you enjoyed um, having a glimpse at that. Um, so this is time where you can ask our chief executive any questions you have. So um, use that comment feature on Facebook. Let us know if you've got any questions for Peter. And we'll do our best to ask them, uh, put your questions to him, um, if not this week, next week. So Peter, one of the things um, you would been talking about is we've got a really exciting um, project um, that's just started um, this week to mark May. Um, do you want to tell everyone a bit about it? We've got we've launched this this month uh, the walk this this May uh, campaign is a really good thing to encourage people to go outside and take advantage of a, a whole range of walks around uh, England. We've got loads and loads of them on our website and you will not be surprised to hear that all of the works, walks on our website are linked to walking past our churches where we hope you'll drop in and be able to say hello to them as you go past. It's a fantastic resource and we're really really excited and hope that people will come out in their droves to enjoy what seems to be the coldest uh, spring on record at the moment. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you live in Northampton, it's certainly been very chilly, but I'm sure the weather will improve. And even if it doesn't, there's beautiful sunshine out there and it's really worth getting out and taking advantage of these walks. Uh, a lot of work's gone into them. So please do take advantage of them. And there are lots and lots all around the country. Um, uh, so please, please take advantage of them. 
Thanks, Peter. And I think we've got one quick question. Um, I see some of that commented in. Um, I hope no one's been digging in the graveyard for that. Um, I'm pleased to say, um, no, we've had no one digging for the gold um, coffin. And um, we do keep it out. So please, anyone, um, if you go there, don't go digging um, for it. Um, it's consecrated graveyard. Um, Peter, one quick question. Um, so you've talked about those fantastic um, wall paintings at Tarrant Crawford. And there's been a lot of comments coming in, um, people saying how uh, beautiful they are. We have quite a lot of churches with wall paintings. We we know at some of our churches where they're currently whitewashed, there are likely to be wall paintings behind the lime wash. Is there a particular reason why um, we're not taking lime wash off and exposing all of those wonderful medieval wall paintings? Well, it's a, it's a very dangerous process taking lime wash off uh, a medieval wall painting because as soon as you start to do that, the wall painting is at, at risk of deteriorating and having damage caused to it uh, and so rather than take things off we have a have a, a policy really of of uh, we conserve as seen and where there are fragments of the paintings obviously we consolidate those and they're available to be seen but where they're coming we don't have a policy for uncovering them because like our archaeologists uh, an archaeologist the, the idea of archaeology the best way of preserving what's there is to actually keep it underground and to keep it covered um, rather than dig it up uh, or, or expose these. And you'll notice actually there's some amazing examples really of photography of some wall paintings that were taken in the 50s. Um, and then if you go and look at sites now, you can see how much the wall paintings have actually faded uh, over time. And so it's quite important to protect them as much as we possibly can. Having said that, we have uh, a collection of most phenomenal uh, wall paintings uh, in, in the CCT's collection. Um, one of my favourites is Broughton, just outside Milton Keynes, where there's a wonderful collection of all sorts of different wall paintings uh, from a, what looks like a, to be a, a sort of guild altar to uh, with St Margaret of Antioch on it, actually, I think. Uh, a a, a marvellous doom painting and St George slaying the dragon as well. Um, always worth a, worth a visit if you're up in, in Buckinghamshire somewhere. Thank you so much, Peter. And I think that brings um, time for Church of the Week um, over. But anyone um, watching on Catch Up or still watching, if you've got questions for our Chief Executive, please comment away um, on that Facebook chat. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please put your um, comments on YouTube and I'll pick them up and we'll try and put them to Peter next week, hopefully. Um, now, um, I'm going to just say, for those of you joining us for the very first time, again, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, I've just looked at, we've got nearly 600 people live so far. Um, so a very warm welcome to you. If this is your very first time, um, please do comment. Let us know where you're watching on, um, watching from, should I say, because um, it's really great that you're joining us today. Now, um, if you see anyone commenting, I'm um, telling you you can watch our lectures free of charge elsewhere, please do not click those links. Um, you can only watch at the moment live on our Facebook page. We are working on getting it accessible onto YouTube as well, um, and we'll keep you posted on that. Now, um, we always say um, every week, um, if you're enjoying these lectures, there's a couple of ways you can support us. So please do like and follow our Facebook account. Um, do have a look at us on social media. So um, if you want to follow Peter, his tag um, is Peter Rez. On Twitter, I've just put up mine there. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's GReynolds1989. Um, but as I said, um, we'll, I'll pop Peter's Twitter link up again in a moment. So if you would like to follow him, you can. Um, now, if you'd like to um, support us in other ways, um, do share these lectures with your friends and family. It's great that so many people come. But do please consider supporting um, our work at the CCT. Peter, in a moment, will tell you a bit about our work at the Trust and why we need your support. But we've got a couple of ways in particular that you can support us. Now, you can text donate. Now, you can donate. Um, so if you've got a mobile phone, you can text CCT to 70331 and that will give us a gift of £3. Um, there's some other text codes I've just put up here. So if you'd like to donate any more, please do um, use one of those codes down there. But also we've launched a um, special membership offer. Um, we launched this a few weeks ago with Dr. Richard Stemp. Um, and he did a phenomenal lecture 
um, for us. And that is if you join us by direct debit from just £3.50 um, per month, um, we will send you a free copy of this wonderful book, which is um, The Secret Language of Churches and Cathedrals Decoding the Sacred Symbolism of Christianity's <laughs> Holy Buildings. Um, but as I said, if you join us, that's by a direct debit from just £3.50 a month. And if you use the offer code lecture, you will be sent this book for free of charge. Now, we've been inundated with so many people um, wanting to support us in this way and it's been great um, that we've run out of stock and um, we've commissioned a brand new exclusive print run from the publishers um, so um, that book is being printed now and we hope to have those dispatched to you in um, they'll be delivered to us in July and we hope to send those out in um, early August hopefully but as I said um, that's by direct debit and if you use the offer code lecture at the checkout but we'll comment away um, on our chat with some links if you'd like to become a member. Now finally um, today to mark today's lecture we've got um, Aidan's fantastic book here British Royal Tombs. Um, the RRP for this book is £16.99, but you can buy it from us um, at reduced cost of just £14 plus postage and packaging. Um, thank you to all of those who've already bought a book with us. Um, we're now packing those um, up and we're, we were going to post them out next week, but we're hoping to do um, a print run, um, sorry, a postage run tomorrow. So we'll be getting them out. But this is a really fantastic pocket guide um, with wonderful illustrations throughout. It's got great photographs um, and images throughout, but my personal highlight um, of the book is when you go to certain cathedrals, there are these wonderful maps included um, showing you where the different tombs are and with really handy um, key. So as I said, if you'd like to buy that from us, um, you can do that at the reduced cost of just £14 plus postage packaging. I think that's enough from me today, everyone. But um, I'm going to push it back to Peter Ayres, um, who's going to tell you a bit more about our work at the Trust and introduce Aidan. Um, but as I said, if you've got any questions, any comments, please use that chat feature. We're watching it. But um, do also use the Facebook direct message um, button. But over to you, Peter. Thanks. Thanks, George. And welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased to see you, how everyone is around the world joining us today. There was a whole slew of people from North America, then someone from South America. And we've got people from Australia, New Zealand uh, and all over the place. So welcome. And of course, in, in the British Isles as well. So everyone is welcome here. and I'm really pleased to see you. So the Church's Conservation Trust is a charity that was set up 50 years ago in 1969 uh, with the express intention of looking after ecclesiastical heritage or historic church buildings which were no longer required for regular worship and it needed their so but, but of huge um, uh, historic importance. And so slowly over time, well, not that slowly, actually, we've collected 356 of these buildings and we take on about two or three more every year on average, although the cost uh, the cost determines how many we take on. And they seem to be getting more expensive as we take these buildings on as well. So um, we're wondering really what the impact of COVID might be on historic parish churches across England as well. Whether or will there be more closures of these buildings? Are they more under threat? The, the threat seems to be more in the in rural areas where there are a huge uh, raft of these fantastic buildings which really define the landscape of England. And um, will how will they be managed into the future is something that concerns us greatly because we think these are the most fantastic most democratic of historic buildings in this country. They're there for everybody, regardless of what you believe, where you come from, who you are. It doesn't matter. These buildings are there for you and always have been. And so we're very keen that we have our doors open and that people come in and use and love them because very rarely does anyone enter one of these buildings and go, it's a bit boring. Well, admittedly, my children do sometimes, but uh, most people actually respond really very well to these fantastic buildings which have such a sense of history and carry the hopes and fears of generations within the walls of them. So your support is very much, very much appreciated. The more support we have from you, the more work we can do and the more buildings we can help save or keep in use, uh, which I think is really, really important. So thank you all very much. Continue to support us. Please do donate. Please do join us as a member. Now, today I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Aidan Dobson, uh, Dodson, sorry, Dodson to us uh, to, to provide the lecture today on British royal tombs and as you've seen already he's a, an author of a book which you can buy from us today at a, a reduced price as well. So Aidan has taught at the University of Bristol since 1996 and has been a honorary professor of Egyptology since 2018. 
He's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London and has published extensively on matters Egyptian. But he also has a wider interest in funerary archaeology and is the, the author of the book that I mentioned before, British Royal Tombs, the second edition which appeared in 2018. You can buy that book from us today. So I'd like to say Aidan has hot-footed it from lecturing, literally. He was in such a hurry. He's, he's wolfed down a sandwich in the time it's taken him to finish his lecture and appear for us today. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to him because all of our lecturers give their time free of charge uh, to support the work of the CCT and hopefully to inform uh, all of you and uh, provide you with a great experience. So a huge thank you to Aidan and over to you. Right, hopefully you can all now hear me. Um, yes, uh, ghosts in the machine. It's always in, I was, it's always one, uh, worrying when you're the first person to use a new piece of um, kit. Anyway, right, let me share my screen rather than have to look at my. Um, right. Okay, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the Royal Tombs of England. The book actually covers the whole of Great Britain, but simply because the time available, I'm restricting it really just to the kings buried in England or were kings of England. Um, there's a whole further um, topic of Scottish kings and also of the spouses of both English and Scottish kings and those of the UK. But so, unfortunately, today, I've just tried to stick this, um, restrict this today to a more focused thing on those within England. If one is looking at the topic of royal tomb, one probably should be going back into prehistoric times because some of these uh, these very impressive um, barrow burials probably are individuals of high status who we probably want to call kings or queens. But the first time we can actually find something which we probably can um, call a royal tomb is probably the famous um, boat burials at Sutton Hoo, in particularly the great one of it. Although no name has ever been identified in the material from the tomb, a fairly good case could be made for it being Redwald, um, the local king in the early part of the 7th century um, AD. But the first time really where we can actually get at burials of named individuals is in, uh, in the Kingdom of Wessex and particularly at the site of Winchester Cathedral. Now, of course, the building we have here um, is post-conquest, but archaeological excavations adjacent to it have revealed the site of the original um, Old Minster. And here we have it. Um, not on the same orientation as the um, the current one, just to one side, which of course has allowed its ground plan to be uh, determined. And from various records, we have got this link, this list of individuals who were buried in the Old Minster, going back into the seventh century and finishing off with William II, William Rufus. One well, notes here that there are some rather important individuals, including um, Egbert, Ethelwolf, Knut, Harter Knut, and William II. Now, in most early pre um, conquest structures, the remains of those who were buried in the original structure are often long lost. But care was taken when the old minster was replaced by the current cathedral to move the various remains which had been in the old minster into the new structure. They moved around a certain amount. Oops, sorry. Um, they, they, removed, they moved around a certain amount, but uh, we will explore their, their, where they move a little bit later on. In contrast, um, others of the early Saxon burials from, of, of Wessex, when their um, burial church was reconstructed, all trace was lost. So although we know that Ethelbald and Ethelbert were buried at Sherborne Abbey, there is nothing 
in the Abbey, which can nowadays be definitely attributed to them. Likewise, um, at Wimborne Minster, where Ethelred I was buried, we do have on the wall here a brass uh, naming the king, but this is clearly much later than his actual date. Um, so again, the detail of his interment remains unclear. Likewise, at Malmesbury, Athelstan's burial, um, completely lost when the uh, abbey was rebuilt. Um, a tomb in within there, which has been called his, is probably not even a tomb at all. And although surviving rather later than most, when the old St Paul's Cathedral um, was demolished following the Great Fire of London, these two burials of um, Sebi of Essex and Ethelred II were both lost. And once again, looking at sort of now lost tombs, Glastonbury, of course, again, rebuilt post-conquest um, with the result that the tombs of Edgar and Edmund II are also um, are now lost. Which takes us back to Winchester, which is the place where we can actually find some of these very, very early um, Saxon kings. And initially, when they were moved from the old uh, old minster into the new location, they seem to have been buried on this reburied on this platform. In exact, looking at the, the textual remains, not one hundred percent clear what they were buried in. Some of them in some form of <coughs> in some form of leaden caskets, but basically on this platform here, which is directly behind the high altar. However, subsequently, um, with one of the rearrangements, they were moved into a series of mortuary chests, which now overlook the, um, the area of the high altar here. Each of them is labelled with a name or a set of names of individuals. But when they've been examined, which happened on more than one occasion, it's quite clear that things have been moved around a significant amount over the years. Um, and the recent, some recent work has been going on to try and sort them out, but only one individual has been positively identified on the grounds that she is female and there is only one female amongst all the various names of individuals who were placed in there although it's hopeful hope one can hope that further work will give a better idea of exactly which which head connects to which knee bone and so on in addition to the uh, old minster a new minster was built directly alongside it um, by alfred the great as his own burial church And in it were buried not only Alfred himself and his wife, but also their son and successor, Edward the Elder. The new minster was demolished long ago, um, but this is a view of the um, excavation of, the, of, of its area. Or should I say of the building which replaced it? The problem was with the um, new minster was it was right directly next to the old minster, and the two got in the way of each other. So, uh, so a little while after Alfred's death, effectively the whole um, institution was moved to Hyde, a little bit further away within Winchester, and that is what we have here. But in many ways, Hyde Abbey was a um, a substitution for the original Old Minster. It, of course, was destroyed at the dissolution um, and only revealed again by archaeological um, excavation. During that, um, the first sort of, although that during that excavation, a number of pieces of bone were found and carbon 14 
has indicated one of them, one of the fragments might actually be from one of the royal burials because the date of this bit of bone is very different from everything else found on the site, significantly earlier. The problem here is it, what's, what's um, one finds particularly galling possibly is it may be that Alfred and Edward's bodies remained intact into the 19th century. Unfortunately, in the 19th century, the um, Winchester prison was built in this area and the foundations of Hyde Abbey were penetrated. And it's possible that at that stage, the in, what may have been intact bodies were destroyed, leaving behind this one fragment which science has revealed as being possibly um, from one of those burials. Westminster Abbey's um, establishment was by Edward the Confessor, and it was intended as his burial church, amongst other, amongst other things. And of course, later would become the principal uh, royal burial place for many centuries. The original Edward the Confessor um, Abbey was effectively lost when Henry III rebuilt rebuilt the structure for his own um, for his own burial purposes. Uh, but a few bits and pieces do survive and Edward the Confessor's burial itself has survived there. This is the shrine of Edward the Confessor, um, constructed when the, when the, when the, when the abbey was, was rebuilt. But it remains about the only uh, saint shrine or significant saint shrine to remain uh, broadly intact across the period of the Reformation. After the conquest by uh, William I, royal burials of kings of England move across the channel for a while because, of course, William I was also a Duke of Normandy and his various, um, number of his various uh, descendants also had strong territorial links with the other side of the channel. William I was buried in the Abbey of St Etienne at Caen which he actually built specifically for his burial. And today one sees in front of the high altar a, a slab marking his tomb. All, although the, all that seems to survive now is one piece of bone. Um, over the years, the body had been um, desecrated, moved and, various, and variously otherwise interfered with, leaving only a tiny fragment left. Um, the body's damage almost started at the point of his burial because apparently they discovered only when they found the rather obese king tried to put him into the tomb that he wouldn't quite fit and had to push rather hard. He would actually died of a ruptured um, colon and also he'd been lying around for a few days by the time they um, tried to put him in. So this bloated body apparently burst um, as it was being put into its coffin and everybody um, left the church owing to the uh, the smell produced. So and then say over the next few uh, centuries more things had happened to to poor William's body and only one piece of bone now survives. His son and successor, uh, William II, is one of the individuals who's ended up in um, one of the uh, mortuary chests in Winchester. And this is a close-up close -up view of one of those chests. And his name is mentioned on this one, um, Rufe, his uh, nickname of Rufus. But also, Canute is also allegedly in the same in the same box, um, along with uh, Queen Emma. And so, unfortunately, only Emma's body has yet been identified as the only female amongst all the bones. And these chests ended up being um, thrown down during the Commonwealth. Um, the, bo the bones resorted. So there are some which are only full of leg bones, some full of skulls, and so on. But so there is work going on at the moment, which hopefully may sort some of them out. But only Emma's body has yet been um, 
formally identified. Henry I um, was buried in an, his own abbey at Reading. A lot of these early monarchs are actually building entire abbeys for the benefit of their burial, and particularly, of course, to allow for um, monks to chant to um, reduce the amount of time they have in purgatory. Reading also destroyed during the, um, the Reformation. And again, there is possible that, his that Henry's body might have survived until the 19th century when Reading Jail was built next door and various um, human remains were revealed and effective and, and based destroyed by the construction work. And it's possible, therefore, that Henry might have survived, but appears no longer to be the case. Although in uh, following on from the rediscovery of, of um, Richard III, hope has been sort of restored and there are people who are perhaps would hope that Henry wasn't buried in the place where they would expect him to have been buried within the Abbey Church and therefore might have survived elsewhere but I think that is very much uh, clutching at straws. Another um, burial abbey destroyed at the Reformation was Faversham um, of King Stephen and his wife but there is local um, local tradition that the body of the king was saved during that and in the local church of St Mary of Charity there is little this little niche here with this uh, Victorian um, uh, brass plaque um, which doesn't really say that um, his body is there um, but say there is a local tradition that he was moved this is one of the most frustrating things when looking at the archaeology of some early royal tombs is that there are local uh, there are local traditions that things various things happened to to bodies it's also particularly also the case in in scotland as well but one can never really narrow them down and so often when one does get to the bottom of it these traditions tend to be rather romantic victorian um fantasies rather than based on any kind of real evidence going back beyond the 19th century. We hop over the channel again for Henry II and Richard I. Um, their tombs in the Abbey at Fautrevaux. Um, once again, um, we're not quite sure where the bodies actually are. The effigies have all survived and are now on display in the uh, in the church. But during the French Revolution, the place was turned into a prison. Um, and also it appears that the, the effigies were moved around a certain amount even before then. So the exact location of where the bodies once had been remains rather unclear. What, one thing we do know where it is, is the, is the heart of Richard I. Um, it's in Rouen Cathedral. And that's certainly a feature of a lot of royal burials during uh, medieval times, is the way that various bits of the bodies will be distributed around their, their, their territories. And certainly the removal of the heart is something which does um, survive longer than most. Um, However, no, Richard I, however, ended up with his bowels in one place, his brain somewhere else. So it was something of a, some, the um, for preparation of a royal body at this stage was something of a butchery activity rather than anything uh, rather more refined. One thing they are trying to do is um, preserve bodies. And we have a number of them who are known to have been preserved in uh, using herbs and spices, all packed into a an overall um, leaden container, which is then placed within a wooden coffin and then finally into whatever the final tomb is. The earliest tomb which remains something like intact and capable of being studied is that of King John, who was buried in Worcester Cathedral. And this is the table tomb which still holds his body. It's been modified somewhat over time. But here, as we can see from this late 18th century etching from when the body was um, examined, we have this trapezoidal coffin 
which is then surrounded by the base of the um, of the tomb, which in its current form dates to um, to Tudor times, but the but much of it is genuinely goes back to John's time, including the body of the king himself, who's shown wearing who was revealed wearing a monk's habit, and his what's happened here is his skull has rotated backwards. So this is the place down here where the spine joins the skull. So, but this has not been examined since the end of the 18th century. And, but it does mean we have this, the earliest example of exactly how an English king was interred. Henry III, who we've already mentioned as being the re-founder of Westminster Abbey, was responsible for creating what ultimately would be the major burial place of English kings. And this is a reconstruction of what it looked like in his day. And of course, there are still key parts of the structure which still go back to his time. And it's rare, and the reason why he built it was partly as for his own burial, but also to ensure that he himself was close to the confessor, whose shrine um, was erected in the centre of the sanctuary area. And subsequently, many royal of royalties of the next few generations were buried in the circuit around it and also various other notables in these various side chapters. So this was very much the place to be seen dead in uh, during the time of Henry the um, III and the succeeding generations. And here is where Henry himself is buried. And it's the first of a series of quite spectacular um, chest tombs um, which were to be built around here. Um, the actual body, as far as we can tell, because uh, it's never been um, um, examined archaeologically, is in probably in the base of it here, and the rest of it is this remarkable uh, gilded figure um, with the heavily inlaid um, all kinds of exotic marbles and others uh, employed to produce this tomb. And his is very much the, the model for the succeeding um, burials. Um, his heart was removed and buried at Fontrevoir, and it's possible that heart may survive in a uh, in, um, in Scotland, uh, because a heart-shaped box containing a mummified heart uh, came out of France during the revolution, allegedly as that of Henry II, um, there's no evidence that Henry II's heart was separately removed for burial at Fontrevaux, so they may have got the number wrong. So it's possible his heart also survives as well. Moving um, on round the um, sanctuary, down here we have the um, burial of Edward I. In contrast to the um, elaborate tomb of his father, Edward is a very simple stone sarcophagus, um, probably possibly intended to be more elaborate, but that's simply how it ended up with a much later um, inscription naming the king on it. This uh, was also has also been opened um, in the early uh, 19th century. And this is a depiction of what was found. Once again, a trapezoidal um, coffin inside with the um, head visible um, there. Um, and here we've actually got it unwrapped. And according to the contemporary reports, the body was um, completely intact, um, still um, holding various scepters and so on. And these really are only a glimpse at what, at the, what the kernel of a medieval um, royal tomb uh, was really like. Again, hasn't been it hasn't been um, in disturbed since. His son Edward II um, ends up in Gloucester Cathedral following his um, 
his death at Barclay Castle. Um, whether he did indeed die from red hot poker, of course, remains a, a question. But in Gloucester Cathedral, an absolutely gorgeous tomb was created for him, probably as a way of his son, Edward III, assuaging his guilt for what had happened to his father. This, this, this almost fantasy um, in alabaster is, or is, is unique amongst um, British royal tombs. So we have this amazing canopy um, over it, and then within that we have the um, effigy itself, a beautifully produced thing, albeit quite badly um, attacked by graffiti over the over the centuries. And underneath the tomb um, lies his coffin. The tomb was opened, but the coffin was wasn't wasn't opened, so we know nothing more about the actual uh, body itself. Edward III goes back to uh, Westminster. And he and his wife um, have their tombs on this side of the uh, of the sanctuary. Here and also we have his grandson and successor, Richard III, Richard II, sorry. So we have this tomb and then Richard II's is a his and hers tomb, the first of these proper his and hers ones. Um, you can see here the amount of damage which has been suffered by these over the years. Um, various statuettes, um, other um, decoration has been removed. But in contrast to what's happened so in so many other places during the Reformation the, uh, and the dissolution of the monasteries, the tombs at uh, Westminster have survived remarkably um, intact. Again, these gorgeous gilded recumbent figures and possibly the finest of them all of, of uh, Edward III, almost sort of summing up what you expect a medieval king to look like. And here, uh, rather different style, we have got um, um, Richard II and his wife, Anna Bohemia. Uh, Richard was not originally buried here. He had built his tomb here. Then, of course, he was deposed and died in mysterious circumstances and was buried temporarily at Chertsey before being moved back into his own tomb at Westminster. It's quite a remarkable structure, say much bigger as a, as a tomb built for two um, and has been investigated uh, more than once. Um, quite a bit of damage was actually done by schoolboys at Westminster School because, on the as as I've mentioned already, the, uh, the sides of a lot of these tombs originally had plaques and statuettes, and one in one place some plaques have been taken away, leaving a a space through into the burial part of it, uh, through which various schoolboys on occasion played with the um, bones and on occasion actually stole various parts of the two royal bodies. Um, this is the skull of Richard II, um, which was actually then properly investigated and the tomb restored in the 19th century. Uh, certain amount of certain of his missing bits were ret were returned and reinterred with him, though he's still not a hundred percent complete. Curiously, for the sort of the mother church of the Church of England, Canterbury Cathedral has only ever received one king's burial, uh, that of Henry the Fourth, and that lies again a, a tomb built for two which is really how the tradition now moves on here he is in the rear part of the uh, cathedral um, another beautiful pair of recumbent images below in the tomb his coffin was um, examined in the 19th century and they even went so far as to um, cut a hole in the leaden coffin and have a, a, a rummage around inside. Um, but apart from the fact the body was apparently relatively well preserved, uh, nothing more um, could be revealed about that. 
His son, Henry V, moves back to Westminster once again. And by now, the circuit around the uh, burial of the confessor has now complete. So what um, Henry does, Henry V does, is he places his tomb beyond that of the confessor, the very, very back side of the sanctuary, and also constructs a remarkable um, chantry chapel above it. So we have a, a two level tomb in many ways. So what we can see here, this is the chantry chapel um, elevated up here, accessed by a spiral staircase here. And then underneath behind this iron gate is the table tomb of Henry V himself. Ultimately, his wife, Catherine of de Valois, was reburied in the, in the uh, uh, Chantry Chapel above during the 19th century after a certain amount of peregrinations around the, uh, the Abbey. And here we've got a view, uh, another view of that particular tomb. So this, this is the, um, are, these are the arches which are supporting the uh, Chantry Chapel above and here is the actual tomb. Interestingly, the actual effigy is made of wood, um, as you can see by the, the way it's um, warped here. Originally had a silver head, which is a bit was long since stolen. So nowadays, when you go to the abbey, um, the head of the king is actually made of glass fiber. Henry VI is another of the kings whose initial burial was in one location and then um, transferred. Again, um, his uh, demise uh, was, not, um, was not natural and he was temporarily buried before being uh, transferred to Windsor um, by Richard III. So therefore, he's, he's actually the uh, second king to be buried at Windsor, directly opposite the individual who was responsible ultimately for his um, de deposition and death, um, Edward IV. Henry's move here was because his um, of, a, of a, a cult which had begun to spring up around him. There was also a um, campaign to make him into a saint, and the decision was to move him here to Windsor. Um, in close connection with the with the current with the new dynasty to try and both um, diffuse any political issues to do with this but also to make sure that Windsor got any of the um, the, uh, bene the financial benefits from the cult St George's Chapel, where that uh, burial of reburial of Henry VI took place, had been begun by Edward IV as his um, burial place, as well as being um, a chapel for the for the, uh, for the for the castle at Windsor. The chapel had originally been begun or begun by um, Henry III, but was entirely uh, was massively extended by. Um, Edward IV. And here, just to the uh, left hand side of the um, old high altar, um, Edward created a very similar kind of tomb to Henry V in the sense that there is a raised chantry chapel, which you can see here from the um, from close to the high altar, which then goes over the um, aisle. And there is this Oriel window, and that is the actual um, chantry chapel is up here. And then directly below it in this archway here is the actual tomb of Edward IV himself. It's been modified on more than one occasion, um, but the actual body lies in a, in a lies below this 19th century um, um, slab in a small vault below. This um, iron railing was originally supposed to be around the tomb itself. And at one stage, there was also a raised dummy sarcophagus as part of it. Let's say the tomb of Edward IV has been mucked around with more than once during the remodelings of, um, of the chapel. And here he actually is. Um, there's this small vault underneath the uh, the monument and 
his body as revealed when examined um, in the late 18th century. He's quite unusual from his predecessors actually being buried in a small vault. Previously, most of the burials were in table tombs with the actual body directly inside, as we saw with King John. In this case, however, we've got another variation on a theme whereby there is this small vault underneath the monument itself. Of course, the most recent um, royal burial to be identified is that of Richard III, um, which all sorts of rumours grew up around the fate of the body. It was known that it had been buried um, in the Church of the Grey Friars at Leicester, but then what had happened to it after the dissolution of the monasteries was a much more uh, matter of debate. And there was a story that the bones had been thrown into the river in, in Leicester nearby. And that was became quite a, um, the popular assumption of what happened to him, even though the actual, um, if one traces that particular um, legend back, it doesn't take us too, all that far back. But of course, as you were, I think probably, as everybody be aware, um, finally in 2013, um, Work was archaeological work was carried out, which both identified the location of the uh, former Abbey Church, but also identified the uh, the body, which is unheard of in archaeology, where you actually have an objective which you actually find when you cut your very first trench, which is exactly what happened with, with Richard III. And so here here he is, just as he was first um, revealed. Um, rather pushed into a coffin probably too small for himself um, given the, the uh, position of the head um, but by a miracle uh, the body hadn't been touched during the the um, demolition of the um, of the abbey church and therefore was able to be found in um, 19, 2013 and then reburied under this a tomb whose design sort of rather splits people's opinions, but lies within Leicester Cathedral, which is only a short distance from where he was originally buried at um, in the Greyfriars. A questionable um, attribution of remains is this urn in the Westminster Abbey. Um, contains the, uh, the bones of two uh, male children found during con um, construction work in the 17th century and identified rightly or wrongly as Edward V, who died mysteriously during uh, the reign of his uncle, Richard III. The bones in here have been examined more than once, but without really any clear conclusions. Now, with the Tudor um, accession to the throne, we have some quite spectacular plans as far as royal burials are concerned. Now, the far end of the uh, of St George's Chapel is a separate building, originally constructed, or at least begun by Henry III as a lady chapel. Henry VII um, decides to um, turn it into a royal burial place, initially for himself and also for Henry VI, who he was then trying to get um, canonised. So the idea was Henry would be moved from um, somewhere a little way off to the left, where he still is, in there to join Henry VII. Henry then, however, decides to be buried at Westminster, and the intention is to then still as a joint burial. But in practice, nothing Henry, is, Henry V and VI is never moved, and instead Henry is buried, buried um, alongside his wife in this amazing chapel which was added on to the uh, cathedral, the abbey at Westminster, originally built by Henry III. And the chapel of Henry VII at the far end of the uh, abbey would really become the, the key high status and kingly and queenly burial place for a very considerable amount of time, uh, focusing initially on the um, burial 
here of Henry VII himself. This is looking down at the amazing uh, fan vaulting of this uh, chapel, which is probably one of the finest ecclesiastical structures possibly in the world. And at the end of it is this remarkable um, metal enclosure within which is the uh, chest tomb of Henry VII, Elizabeth of York, his wife. They're not actually buried, however, in the chest tomb itself, but like Edward IV, they've gone for the vault option. And this is the opening of that vault um, during the 19th century, when extensive investigations were made of the various royal tombs at, Wentz, at Westminster, uh, led by Dean Stanley. And this is a view looking into the burial chamber as it was first as revealed. And you note that the way that the coffins, which are actually these are lead in their cases, are shaped like a human body. And in fact, if you didn't know what this was, you'd perhaps think for a moment these were Egyptian mummies. But they're not. They are uh, royal burials with Henry VII in the middle and Elizabeth York on, of York on the right. They originally would have been in massive wooden cases, but those cases were removed to make room for the third um, body uh, which is in the uh, in the vault which is James the first of England sixth of Scotland his burial here is probably trying to make a very clear political point of course as a foreign monarch taking over the English monarchy being buried in the same chamber as the uh, founder of this particular part of the uh, this this chapel was probably intended to be quite a point and in doing so, he left his wife behind because there is a perfectly good vault made for two just to one side of this, but only um, his wife is actually buried in that. James himself, say, ending up with Henry and Elizabeth. Henry VIII also has um, thoughts about using the tomb house um, at Windsor for his burial. And indeed, on his death, he is buried in a small um, vault in the main um, St. George's Chapel. But then the intent was to move him here under a huge, uh, a very, very elaborate monument, even outdoing that of his father at Westminster. <clears throat> and this is it. This is a reconstruction of it anyway. Um, however, it was never quite finished. Um, and the body was never removed to it. And it was then dismantled during the Commonwealth. So only a few various bits and pieces, including some of these huge candlesticks have found their way to various uh, locations around Europe. And the actual sarcophagus, a dummy sarcophagus, the idea is once again, they're still talking about a vault, it's gonna be underneath. The sarcophagus has ended up being reused to hold uh, Lord Nelson because this day the, the, a lot of this was dismantled during the Commonwealth, but other bits of it stayed uh, around in the, um, in the tomb house um, until, as we'll see, some major work was carried out on it uh, during the Georgian era. And so, therefore, that's the, the sarcophagus of Nelson is actually the sarcophagus of um, Henry VIII and probably originally made for Cardinal Wolsey. So it's been very much a, a passed on uh, from one uh, individual to the next until say, Nelson ended up in it. So this is where the monument of Henry VIII was being constructed. He was actually buried back here in the main body of the, of the chapel. And here is the uh, chamber as revealed in the 19th century with Jane Seymour um, buried next to him. This is Henry's coffin itself. It's actually partly burst open. And it may have been a case of um, built up gases having, um, let's say, uh, made him it made him explode. Um, next to him is another interloper, which is Charles the first, because after Charles's um, execution, um, there was no question of him being allowed to be buried at um, Westminster. And therefore, he was, however, allowed to be buried at Windsor, and they managed to find the vault of Henry, the, Henry VIII, 
and therefore that's where where Charles was placed. There's also on the uh, coffin is a later introduction, which is a couple of children of Queen Anne, whose uh, stillborn children who were placed in here as well. The Henry VII Chapel does have a remain the, uh, the preferred burial place for quite some time. But the level of sort of the, the, uh, the level of uh, spectacularness, if that's actually a word, the spectacle, I, that's the word I should be looking for, the spectacle of the two of the royal tombs starts to decline somewhat. So although the uh, tomb of uh, Edward the Sixth um, is underneath and uh, is uh, accompanied by an altar. His act. This is there is no kind of table tomb or any other kind of um, monument above it. Uh, this is the uh, coffin plate of the king, which was revealed again when, like so many of the uh, royal tombs at at Westminster, the uh, coffin the uh, tomb was examined in the nineteenth century. So there he is, just at the head of where his grandfather's uh, tomb lies. The uh, other two children of Henry VIII, Elizabeth I and Mary I, are buried um, in a, uh, the Letha Table tomb, a quite, a, quite an interesting one, but still not quite as over the top as the, as the two Henry's ones were going to be in a side chapel of the, uh, of the Henry VII's chapel with um, Elizabeth lying on top of her sister. Um, and this is part of the, uh, the co her coffin, which is again revealed in the 19th century, although the coffin wasn't actually opened. Although an inscription mentions both queens, it's very much the queen at the uh, tomb of Elizabeth I with Mary very much as an also ran. Another um, tomb of very similar design um, was provided for Mary, Queen of Scots, by her son, James I. Of course, Mary had been executed, um, buried initially um, at Peterborough, but then James I moved her over to um, Westminster, and she lies pretty well opposite the, uh, the tomb of Elizabeth I. Very, very, and very, very similar piece, piece of work. Although the, the um, vault of Mary I and Elizabeth I is quite small, it's a much larger vault of uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, and quite a few uh, members of her, her descendants were buried down there. Prince Rupert of the Rhine and people like that are all in that particular vault, as is also Henry, Prince of Wales, the elder uh, brother of Charles I. And there, closer view of the effigy. As you've already seen, uh, James I um, ended up being buried alongside Henry VII, Elizabeth of York, in Henry's tomb. So there's no actual monument for James I. And that lack of a monument for um, royal burials continues for a considerable amount of time. So you've already mentioned Charles I um, ending up in Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth's um, vault, but after that, the next bunch of Stuart kings are all buried together in one vault. Um, but before, of course, the the royal um, royal line resumes, we have that brief interlude of the Commonwealth, and on his death. Oliver Cromwell is buried in a vault at the far end of Henry the Seventh Chapel, um, in very much in very much royal state, uh, very much a royal way. Indeed, it's interesting that there is no attempt during the Commonwealth, as far as one can tell, to interfere with any of the uh, royal tombs at Westminster. And one thing which we do have of Oliver is actually his mummified head, after the restoration. He and other regicides were um, exhumed and their uh, bodies um, hung at Tyburn, but then they were, uh, the bodies were then uh, decapitated and the heads put on Westminster Hall. On Westminster Hall. 
Oliver's survived, fell down in a storm under James II, and after various um, peregrinations, was actually anatomically examined in the 1920s, and enough evidence was visible that it could be confirmed to be his, um, his head. And it's now buried in Sydney Sussex College Chapel in Cambridge. Another, the other um, of the Lord Protectors, um, Richard Cromwell, is buried here in Hursley Church, um, a very a very modest mention as part of an overall his overall family um, plaque here. As I say, once the Stuarts are then uh, back, um, Westminster continues to be the royal burial place, but in a modest way, so that the that Charles II, um, William the Third, Mary the Second and Anne are all crammed into a very, very limited amount of space. There is no monument whatsoever for these. Um, and the exact location was, un was, was, was somewhat uncertain through until the uh, 19th century. The chests here are for the internal organs. So where at this period, the body is eviscerated on uh, following its death, packed in herbs and spices, and the same goes for the internal organs. There was this sketch for a monument for Mary II and William III, but nothing was done about it. And to say, for the next few generations, we have very, very little in the way of, of marking. The move to uh, the Hanoverian dynasty means that we have for the first of the Hanoverians, George I, his burial is actually in Germany, in Hanover, in the Linnischloss, or in, the, uh, in the chapel of that, um, which was very badly damaged during the Second World War, um, as a result of which the body was later moved to an ancestral uh, chapel in a nearby park. So here in Herrenhausen, this he is now buried um, in the crypt of the mausoleum of um, one of his successors, um, Ernst August I. So these are the, actually the tombs of Ernst August and his wife. So, um, George is in the uh, in the crypt. George II goes for a very uh, ends up digging up the whole of the central part of the uh, chapel and creates this um, this vault uh, contained intended to be a family vault. Um, here we can see the descent to it. And at the end here, we have a sarcophagus made for two, for George II and his wife, with various members of his family in these uh, side uh, niches. Similar kind of approach taken by George III, but he uses the long uh, defunct tomb house as the venue for his vault and cuts a very similar vault into the rock underneath the, uh, the chapel. So this is it. So basically the whole of the floor of that chapel is lifted. So that is where the final dissolution of what had been left of Henry VIII's um, planned um, burial arrangements. And so what we here have now is this shaft down which the uh, coffin is lowered. This has now got an electric lift in it. And that is where Prince Philip descended. I'm sure many people have seen, watched that on um, TV. And then the coffin is then taken along to the um, the main chain, main vault itself at the end here. And this is how it was after the burial of William the Fourth. Because initially the approach was that George the Third and his family would be buried at the end here on this podium, and then later kings on here, and possibly to be moved to the side um, later on. <laughs> There was a major rearrangement of this later in the 19th century, um, and now all of the various coffins are on the side, um, on the side shelves. Uh, his work, this is a, a view, a more recent view, showing half the rearrangement. And also, a little bit later on, those um, shells were given gilded um, gates on them as well to make the whole thing rather more uh, rather more impressive.
but still nothing above ground to mark the uh, the location of this apart from a small um, brass plaque saying um, indicating the where the shaft to the vault actually goes. Victoria goes for a completely different um, approach. Following fashions in Germany, she builds a standalone mausoleum at Frogmore out in Windsor Great Park. And in the centre of that, we have the tomb made for two for her and Prince Albert. An amazing piece of Victoriana. Another view of their tomb. Edward VII goes, completely changes the approach once again. Initially, he is buried in the royal vault, and that is simply where he's now lying. He's lying directly after the burial. But in his case, the, the body was subsequently removed, and on the death of his wife, Queen Alexandra, was buried in a medieval-style table tomb directly adjacent to the tomb of Henry the Sixth and directly opposite that of Edward IV. So we're now, interesting when you're looking at the way that the development of these royal tombs moves, you've got from table tombs to vaults to unadorned vaults, and then back to medieval table tombs again. And very much the same approach is taken for George V. Um, whereby he has a table tomb here in the main body of the chapel. But then we have another shift in, um, in tradition because for George VI burial, they go back to the old idea of a chantry chapel. And this has, is an addition made to St. George's Chapel in the 1960s to hold the burial of George VI. An interesting 1906, it's almost 1960s car park car, um, meets a, me, a medieval chapel. A very interesting thing. And I'm not sure nowadays it would be possible to get any kind of uh, heritage approval for something like that. But it is a, a lovely little thing. Um, here we've got the, the, the vault for George VI and now and the Queen Mother with some fine 60s stained glass and these medallions for uh, the couple. The final sort of kingly burial to have taken place um, thus far is here at also at Windsor and Frogmore. This is Victoria's uh, mausoleum. And in front of it has, since the 1930s, developed a royal burial ground for um, lesser members of the royal family. Indeed, some of them are actually, in, some of these burials originally took place in the royal vault, um, but then were transferred here into um, earthen graves uh, more recently. And it's in this royal burial ground uh, here we find the burial of the Duke of Windsor, the former King Edward VIII. Um, and here is a view of him and the Duchess of Windsor's uh, tombs. It's quite notable they're quite a long way away from the rest of the royal family. And it seems that the sort of cold shouldering of, of them in life has rather continued here in death. Anyway, that's just a very, very brief overview of the English end of um, royal tombs. The uh, book um, on the right there, the second edition of it, also covers the Scottish royal tombs. And of course, all of ones which I've talked about in much, much more detail, and also the royal um, consorts as well. So it tries to be as comprehensive as possible on that. Apologies for the technical uh, difficulties. Um, it's always the case when you try something new uh, with IT, something goes wrong. But hopefully everybody's been able to hear all this properly. And I've, I'll be, of course, happy to take any questions. Sorry, um, you wouldn't have heard me there because I muted myself. So sorry, everyone there. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Aidan. That was fantastic. So we're, everyone, we're shortly going to be going into question time with Aidan, where we... Um, we've had quite a lot of questions already. So now's the time. If you have got any questions, please do comment away um, and we'll do our best to um, get those to Aidan. If we don't have time today, I know we have overrun, but I'll do my best to get as many in as possible. As Aidan said, if you'd like to buy um, 
his book, um, British Royal Tombs. You can buy that from us for from just for just fourteen pounds um, from us. The RRP is sixteen ninety nine, so we're doing it at discounted price. So buy it from us for fourteen pounds plus patient packaging. Um, all the profits from this book are helping us to care for historic churches in our care across England. So please do consider buying the book, and um, we'll also post a link um, if you wanted to become a member with us. So as I said, membership. Um, is just three pound fifty per month um, by direct debit, and when you do that by direct debit and use the offer code Lecture in Capitals, we will send you a free copy of this wonderful book, which is uh, the Secret Language of Churches and Cathedrals. Um, you will receive your copy in August, but in the meantime, you'll get um, uh, other benefits of membership. So, without any further delay, um, we're going to go into question time. So, um, Aidan. Um, Thank you so much um, for some of the questions um, for your lecture there. And we've had lots of questions come in. So I'm going to jump straight in if that's OK. Um, someone's asked here, boat burials like Sutton Hoo seem rare. Why might a king have a boat burial rather than being buried within an abbey? I think we're talking, bear in mind, we're talking about here still during the tail end of paganism. Um, it's Red Wall, one of the reasons why we think it's Red Wall who may be buried at Sutton Hoo is because he's one of the last pagan kings of East Anglia and they're following the Viking tradition of, of this kind of thing. So it's, 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 it's really the tail end of a whole of a tradition before we start getting a uniform bunch of um, Christian, Christian rulers who of course will be buried in, um, in, in religious, in, in, um, in churches, abbeys and such like that. Thanks, Aidan. And um, was there a particular reason? Because we talked about, you, or you, you mentioned quite a, a, a bit that there, were, there was lead used in quite a few tombs. Was there a particular reason why they chose the material lead? I think the main thing about lead is it's very easy to work. If you're trying to produce a, a container, it can, be, it, can be, it can be shaped very, very easily. It also can be sealed quite easily, one of the reasons why, of course, we use it for, for plumbing and so on. And the key point about a lead coffin is it mustn't leak. Um, we have example, as I already mentioned, there's a possibility that, it, that um, Henry VIII might have gone bang. And there are um, accounts of other people leaking somewhat. So I think it's simply because it's, the, it's about the one material which was available to medieval craftsmen, which allowed them to have a hermetically sealed container. And I think that's really interesting, um, Aidan, so I'll, I'll make sure you're on for this, but um, it's really interesting because there are, if you go to some major um, cemeteries in England, particularly a place like Highgate, you still see people where they are sealed in lead tombs. They have tappers and they have to go and tap um, the tombs to let the gases that build up um, out. So it's, um, it's pretty macabre, but um, uh, there's some real fun horror stories about um, graveyard keepers hearing bangs and sort of being startled. Um, so another question that's come in um was you talked about at winchester the bones of a female um was that possibly emma of normandy that is her yes yes that's quite that's quite that's, that's a queen emma who's yes and she's, and, and, and she's actually now on this on display in the uh triforium gallery because she's the one they've been able to identify exactly who it is and when we, because you, know, you talked about um, sort of the embalming process, um, sort of that the the, um, the soft tissue, what the organs were removed, um, and sensitive parts of the country, are there? Because uh, obviously your expertise is in um, Egyptology. Um, are there, there lots of similarities between how British royals were treated in burial um, as opposed to you know what happened in ancient Egypt? There's a there's a there's some similarities certainly in the sense that there seems a desire to preserve the body, um, although from the, the removal of the internal organs for the Egyptian point of view, simply to make that more possible rather than sort of spreading yourself around your domains, which the medieval uh, monarchs did. There always seems to be this this desire to preserve the the uh, the mortal remains. Interesting, even when that is something which, strictly speaking, your religion, you know, is it, you know, mummifying something is exactly the opposite from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Uh, thanks, Aidan. And um, one of the other things that it was, um, we've had a couple of comments about was um, you talked about, obviously, Henry VIII and um, 
Henry um, effectively tried to steal the um, tomb of um, Thomas Wolsey and it wasn't used. And you mentioned about Nelson. Was it that Nelson was buried in the sarcophagus or the, um, the vault? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether he's in the sarcophagus or in that podium of there. He's certainly not in a vault. He's certainly in the tomb. But whether or not it's actually in the sarcophagus or in the sort of the, the rectangular podium underneath, I'm not sure. I've not managed to find out. That's a sort of interesting detail. It's actually often very, very difficult to track down. Um, and that was one of the things when I was actually researching the book was actually to try and find documents which confirmed one way or the other some of these kinds of um, bits of information. And during the funerary rites and the preparation of the body, um, you, you showed that really interesting vault. I think it was of a multiple of, of the Georgians buried together. And you s said how, you know, there were separate caskets for, again, for the vital organs. Um, and But you mentioned about herbs and spices. And someone's asked, um, are there particular records that survive that? Do we know what spices and herbs they used? <laughs> There are a few, I managed to find a few um, recipes, um, which I think I quoted something in in the book. I don't know whether I actually, whether it did actually tell you. Um, yes, well, one of, the, one of the recipes we've got here um, is, and the coffin should be filled with dry arom aromatic herbs, such as rue, wormwood, thyme, scordium, marjoram, and others. So basically, you, you you basically put that in the uh, around, pack that around the corpse, and then solder the the solder down the lead, lead coffin. But there okay. is actually that there's a complete there's a complete um, recipe for embalming in the book. Well, there you go, everyone. If you'd like an, a regal or a royal embalming recipe, get the book, and um, you've got one there. Um, uh, we get more questions coming, so I'm going to do my best to go through them. But what's happened to James II? Was he buried in exile in France? Yeah, well, but, well James II is quite an interesting one. I, I had to cut him out for, for reasons of time. But, um, yeah, he was, he was buried in various bits. His body, the intention, he, he always believed that ultimately that the Stuarts would prevail and he'd come back and be buried in Westminster Abbey. So he refused to actually let himself be buried. His, body, his coffin was simply left in a chapel in a, in a church in, in Paris. He also had his brain taken out and put in a container in the Scots College in um, um, Paris. His intestines were buried in his local parish church at saint germain en laye but everything was destroyed at the uh, during the French Revolution except for his intestines. So in the church at saint germain en laye are his bowels along with the bowels of his daughter which are the only parts of any of the royal family to survive. Fascinating. And uh, we, we, we've got more coming in. But um, have you researched um, uh, or included any details of the burials of the native Welsh princes, a number who are buried at Strata, Florida? I haven't done, no. I very much... It was, uh, I, I very much restricted myself to people who were specifically kings, i.e. of Scotland, England, or the... Uh, but it's certainly something which would be worth, I'd like to sort of follow up on sometime. And um, uh, links again to research, but um, uh, apart from Canute that you mentioned, do you know anything about the early Anglo-Saxon king burials? Well, so the only ones we've got are the ones I mentioned at um, the at, at Winchester. We have a few other ones who are mentioned in um, in the literature. So we've got ones where various sort of chronicles say that somebody was buried in a certain a certain church or other so we've got a, quite a few of those but the ones whereby we've actually got formal remains is really limited to the um the mortuary chests at winchester and um uh, we've got time for a couple more questions i think but um some's asked um, particularly where is george the fourth buried he's at windsor he's in the vo royal vault oh. so and basically you... everybody Oh, sorry, I, I'm sorry, uh, I'll let you finish that bit because um, someone's asked a particular thing about the Windsor Vault as well. Yeah, so, so George IV was there, William IV is there, George III is. Also, George's um, daughter, Princess Charlotte, is also 
in the vault. Well, interestingly, her, she's got a quite impressive monument quite a long way from the vault. So she's almost the exception to the rule of lacking of, lacking of um, monumental um, memorials. Thanks. And, and you showed us the really interesting pictures um, of Queen Elizabeth II's father and her, the Queen, late Queen Mother buried at Windsor. Um, someone's asked, what happened, what's happened with Princess Margaret? Was she interred with them? Yeah, she was, um, she was cremated and the urn put in the vault with George VI and Queen Elizabeth. And I, I think we've got time for one final question, Aidan. Um, what is your favourite royal tomb? In some ways, I, have, I really like George V's one. Um, it's a lovely example of taking a medieval um, approach, but with sculpture, which is very much of the 1930s. So, yeah, I think in many ways, I'd rather like George V. I think that's a great answer. And thank you so much, Aidan, for your time today. Again, apologies, everyone, for the technical um, issues we had um, at the start of the lecture today and for overrunning. Um, we've, as I said right at the start, we've switched on to a new platform. So we've got a couple of TV issues, but hopefully um, the quality of this feed has been so much better than previous um, lectures. So do comment away, let us know if the quality was better. Also, um, please everyone do comment if this is your first time um, joining one of our lectures, because we'd love to get your feedback if you enjoyed it and how we can improve it. But as always, if you've got um, more questions, keep commenting away. If you've got ideas for future lectures, please commenting, I'm booking up now into 2022. Um, so we've got loads more lectures planned for you. Um, Next week, we're going to be joined by Professor Alec Ryrie, from, um, who's a professor of history of Christianity for Durham University. And he's going to be talking to us about the identities of the Church of England. And uh, it's um, one of the common um, themes about the Church of England is it's got this identity crisis. Is it Catholic? Is it Protestant? Um, is it Reformed? So we're going to be going through some of those questions next week. Um, so do join us at the same time. In a few more weeks, we'll be um, changing slightly on Facebook how you join the lectures as part of this new um, system we're using. So going forward, um, in a couple more weeks' time, the lectures will be so much easier for you to join, um, and hopefully it will solve um, a couple of the challenges people have been having. But as I said at the start of the lecture, if you'd like to buy Aidan's book, you can do so. You can buy that for £14 for postage and packaging. Um, we'll comment away with the link. Um, also, if you'd like to become a member from just £3.50 a month, you can do so, um, and if you use the offer code lecture when you apply for direct, join by direct debit, you'll get a free copy of this book. We'll also um, comment away with a link. But if you've got any questions, any um, anything at all um, about either buying the books or um, any other questions you'd like to ask um, Professor Dodson, please do keep commenting away. But thank you so much, everyone. It really has been um, a great, um, great lecture today, and I look forward to seeing you all at a future lunchtime lecture.